I think I can start with the introductions then. Hello and welcome everybody to the Be Waste Wise webinar of the month. I'm Akanksha Singh. I'm the community builder at Be Waste Wise. And uh, we are again here with uh, another waste dialogue, this time focusing on uh, Latin uh, countries. Uh, those of you who are joining our platform for the first time, let me give you a little introduction on uh, our organization. Be Waste Wise is a non-profit organization uh, growing around the principles of uh, dialogue and diversity, addressing the need for knowledge dissemination on waste management uh, since 2013. It's been a decade that uh, Be Waste Wise has been bridging the waste solutions expertise gap worldwide. Today, we have more than 12 moderators who are coming up from different parts of the world and society. Together, they're posing questions and teasing out insights and guiding conversations such as these, uh, which are uh, much relevant uh, other than online or offline platforms. We have more than 300 contributors as well who have taken part in this journey so far. If you see the value in making this diverse sustainability dialogue such as these available uh, free of charge to anyone and everyone, then uh, support us in this mission. Our donation, every donation helps us in creating, curating and producing such webinars on diverse topics. And every donation enable us to bring perspectives that are hard to find elsewhere. We encourage you all to please check out our website and donate. We will be sharing the link for the donation page on the chat as well. Uh, now, moving on to the discussion today, we have Vishwas. Uh, he's one such moderator who is instrumental in guiding conversations and sharing insights for many years together now for our audiences. Vishwas is the co-founder of Empire Global. He has over more than 10 years of international experience in circular economy, waste and water management, financial analysis, climate change resilience, and sustainable cities. Vishwas has implemented over 4,000 tons per annum capacity of decentralized waste recycling systems and designed over uh, uh, 150,000 tons per annum of centralized waste treatment systems. Uh, today, Vishwas, along with the esteemed panel we have today to explore how Latin American and Caribbean countries can accelerate the elimination of dump sites and substandard waste management uh, to promote waste prevention through national and local government initiatives. Uh, to address this topic, we today we have on our panel Kate, who is the waste sector manager on the methane pollution prevention team at the Clean Air Task Force. In this role, she is supporting the team in advancing strategies and policies to introduce waste methane emissions uh, globally. On the other hand, we have uh, Jose, who is an independent environmental consultant. For more than 13 years, his experience uh, includes uh, areas such as waste management, solid waste management, air quality, and environmental assessments throughout Arizona, California, New Mexico, and Texas. Now, before we further proceed to this exciting discussion, please note that this webinar is being uh, recorded and will be uploaded on our website and YouTube uh, channel. Please use the Q&A function for all your queries to the panel. And we request you and urge for maximum participation from the audience to pose as many queries as possible uh, to the panel uh, using the Q&A section. We uh, encourage you all to post your uh, comments, your uh, opinions, and anything that you want to have for the panel, any uh, you know discussion points that you want to uh, discuss, you can use the chat function for that. Uh, we try and resolve as many queries as possible. And if due to our time limitation, if there are any queries which are unanswered, we will get them answered with our panel post the webinar. So back to the topic, Vishwas, over to you. Very much uh thank you very much Akansha, for the introduction uh it's a pleasure to moderate this session again for be waste wise and thank you everyone for attending this webinar uh so this is a bilingual webinar and can be so please feel to post your questions in spanish or in english so i'll just give a short introduction in spanish and then switch to english Buenos días a todos. Bienvenidos al webinar de hoy sobre un tema muy importante para la región sobre los rellenos sanitarios y también botaderos en, en, en América Latina y Caribe. Uh, como sabemos, el, la cantidad de residuos que generamos en la región supera más de medio, medio millón de toneladas al diario. Es, es casi cerca de 600 mil toneladas al día. Más del 90% de estos residuos no está aprovechado bien. Tenemos más de 10.000 sitios en, en la región de América Latina y Caribe 
donde el manejo de residuos no es de alta estándar o alta calidad. Y uh, aunque tenemos alto porcentaje de recolección de residuos, el porcentaje de aprovechamiento, especialmente de orgánicos, considerando que más del 50% de residuos es orgánicos en la región, no está aprovechando bien. Esto tiene impactos sociales, impactos ambientales, impactos climáticos, que vamos a abordar un poco so con los expertos José Luis Davila y también Kate Sigaloy. Um, y, y si tienen preguntas, por favor, pueden poner en el chat en español o también en inglés. Uh, thanks everyone for joining today. So just to give you a little introduction. Uh, uh, so basically uh, the webinar today will focus on the state of landfills and also dump sites in the region. The region produces more than half a million tons of waste per day, approximately about 600,000 tons per day. Uh, over 90% of the waste is not really uh, utilized or recycled. More than half the waste is organic in nature, which means there's a lot of climate impact, especially methane, which Kate will speak about. Also in the region, uh, landfills and dump sites are, are an important uh, aspect to consider, both in terms of opportunities and problems. So both our speakers, Jose Luis Davila and Kate Siegel, will, will give an insight into this and what's happening in the region and what are the potential solutions and problems that are occurring in the region. Um, there are over 10,000 sites which, are, which have substandard waste management practices, uh, which shows an urgent need to resolve this issue. Um, so without much further ado, let's get on to the presentation. And thank you very much again for attending. If you have any questions, please post it in the chat or in the Q&A section in the Zoom. Uh, so over to our first speaker for today, Kate. Uh, Kate, uh, as Akanksha already introduced, Kate is the waste sector manager uh, for methane pre pollution prevention and clean air task force. Kate has a vast experience in this topic in the region. And over to you, Kate, to uh, to brief us about the topic. Thanks, Fish, and good morning, everyone. Bear with me while I get my slides set up. Um, I think everyone can see my slides, hopefully. Uh, yeah. you, <laughs> no one can, I can't see anybody, so you can't give me a thumbs up. But um, as Vishen um, mentioned, I work for the Clean Air Task Force, or CATF. Uh, we are an international nonprofit that focuses on a variety of climate and energy topics. And my team looks specifically at super pollutants and, and more specifically at methane mitigation from major sources around the world. And today I'm gonna sort of focus on the connection between methane and waste sector and dive into what's happening in Latin America. Um, perfect. So climate impacts are here today. 2023 was the hottest uh, year on record and around the world we saw a number of heat waves, wildfires, floods, and other extreme weather events. We know that if we hope to bend the climate curve and see progress within our lifetimes, we need to implement solutions today. So um, as Vish mentioned, and as I mentioned, I'm on the methane pollution prevention team at CHF. Um, I'm, and before I discuss um, methane mitigation solutions, I want to sort of ground us in why, why methane, why is this important? So methane is the second most abundant greenhouse gas after carbon dioxide, and it's also 80 times more potent than carbon dioxide is over its short lifetime in the atmosphere. According to the IPCC, methane is responsible for up to half a degree of warming that we're currently experiencing. So I think one of the main things that I want you to take away from this presentation is that mitigating methane is the most effective way we have to address the near-term harms from climate change. It will take decades before we see the benefits from reducing emissions of, of carbon dioxide. And that's that pink line there. And that's really important that we do it and we continue to because we need to be thinking on, on that longer term time frame. But methane mitigation reduces warming quickly because methane only stays in the atmosphere for about 12 years compared to the 100 years from CO2. So the the steps that we take today in terms of methane mitigation, we can see those well within our lifetimes. So what are the main sources of methane? Where is this gas coming from? 
Um, the three main anthropogenic or human driven sources of methane are the fossil fuel sector, which includes primarily oil and gas and coal mining emissions, uh, the agriculture sector, and that comes from a variety of sources you can see in the graph, and then the waste sector, which includes uh, wastewater and municipal solid waste. And in the waste sector, the methane is stemming from the breakdown of organic waste in the oxygen-free environments that are found in landfills, dump sites, and wastewater facilities around the world. And satellites have also started to help us reveal waste as a major source of methane. Uh, you might've seen in the news on Monday, I think, that SpaceX uh, launched a rocket that had a satellite on it that will help detect methane around the world. Uh, the, meth the satellite's called MethaneSat, and it's part of an initiative led by EDF. Um, but there are already a number of other satellites in orbit that are being used to detect methane from landfills and help us to better understand these sources. So this image is from a study that was published a year or two ago um, that looked at methane from landfills in Argentina, Pakistan, and then um, two landfills in India uh, and compared it to city level emissions, um, showing the differences between what's currently being reported and what's actually happening in, in these places. Um, and emissions from landfills are being detected all over the world. So uh, on the screen here, you can see plumes that have been detected by two satellites, um, or rather the Tripomi satellite, which is the pink dots. And then the blue dots are uh, GHG detected landfills. GHG Sat is a, um, a company that has a constellation of satellites and they look at a number of different sources. So, the waste sector is critically important to look at um, when we're talking about methane emissions, um, because when we actually look at the mitigation potential for solutions that are readily available today, so things that we have the technology for that we could put in place tomorrow if we wanted to, um, only the oil and gas sector can reduce more methane by 2030. And this is a, a really critical decade um, for, for mitigation for methane. So diving into Latin America, uh, Latin America is responsible for approximately 12% of global waste sector methane emissions. Major emitters in the region include Brazil, Mexico, Argentina, and Colombia. And these emissions are driven by the region's reliance on landfills and open dump sites like Vish was mentioning before, upwards of 90% of, of the waste in the region. Um, is still disposed of in these facilities. More than 40% of Latin America's municipal waste is sent to dump sites, burned, or um, left in bodies of water. 45% um, of solid waste is disposed of in sanitary landfills, many of which don't have the landfill gas capture systems that we know are effective at, at mitigating some of the methane. And only 4% of waste in the region is recycled in any way. So what this means is that Latin America has a lot of potential to improve waste management and mitigate its contribution to global methane emissions. But what does that mean? What are the solutions uh, that are available to mitigate methane? As I mentioned before, these solutions are, are we have them today, they're relatively cost effective. We know what they are. Um, so the best thing that we can do to reduce waste methane is just to reduce food and other organic waste that's sent to landfills. So this includes um, food loss and waste from upstream sources like farms and food processors, commercial entities, um, as well as downstream sources like restaurants or our own kitchens. And um, there are a number of policy and technology options to do that. I don't wanna get into the details today, um, but, but that's really what, what's gonna, uh, that's really the best thing that we could be doing. So next up after we prevent as much as we can, we need to separate our organic, our, our organic waste at the source and divert it for treatment um, using technologies, including compost, anaerobic digestion, and other emerging, emerging technologies like black soldier flies. And then finally, we need to upgrade <clears throat> and close existing dump sites, moving them to engineered sanitary landfills that have gas capture systems in place and use bio covers um, to further oxidize methane coming through uh, the soil covers. And these solutions have a number of co-benefits that make them, um, you know, even more, um, 
advertising. <laughs> That's a bad word, but um, so the first and <laughs> the best thing that we can do, good luck translating that, Vish, um, is to reduce, um, these solutions will help to reduce air pollution and improve environmental and public health in our cities. Uh, they'll reduce odor from these sites, pests and vermin. And then they'll also reduce the pollution from the transportation of waste and open burning. So in most cities, waste is transported kilometers outside to the locations of the landfills and that has a huge impact in, in local air pollution. There's also cost savings for cities from extended landfill life, fuel savings from reducing those transportation costs. I think the World Bank um, has stats saying that municipal solid waste is often the largest line item in a municipality's budget. So it's really important uh, anywhere we can get cost savings in, in this sector. Uh, next up, job creation from um, you know, new facilities as well as improved working conditions for informal sector workers. We can make our cities cleaner, improving land values and tourism associated with that. And then finally, um, improving source separation and, and collection. One of the solutions that I discussed before also has ties to reduce marine litter um, and, and plastics, which is you know, critically important in, for our ocean ecosystems and a variety of other reasons. So Latin America is already doing a lot on all of this. I don't want to to say that the region has um, not moved yet. Uh, so some examples of initiatives uh, include the North American Leaders Summit from last year where Mexico, Canada, and the United States uh, pledged to reduce methane emissions from solid waste and wastewater in their countries by 15% by 2030. Um, Chile's National Organic Waste Management Strategy. So Chile is a, is a leader in, in the region for moving forward on, on these um, solutions. Uh, and in the strategy, they've proposed to achieve a 66% reduction, uh, or sorry, 66% recovery of organic waste from municipalities by 2040, and they have a number of interim steps in between. Um, really exciting, uh, late last year, the Inter-American Development Bank uh, launched the Too Good to Waste initiative, with, in which they approved um, projects totaling upwards of $370 million that will improve waste management and methane mitigation. Projects are currently approved in Argentina, Ecuador, and the Dominican Republic. And I believe that they're also about to open a call for proposals um, looking for additional projects in other countries. And then um, we have the Lowering Organic Waste Methane Initiative, which aims to deliver at least 1 million tons of waste sector methane reductions by 2030, as well as unlock over 10 billion in public and private investment in that time. Uh, low methane currently plans to work with about 40 subnational jurisdictions around the world. Um, and, and this is just a short list. I don't even have the global methane pledge on this slide. Um, and I think that's because the, the pledge is not just focused on, on the waste sector and not just focused on, on the region. Um, but, but there is a lot going on. Um, and something I wanted to highlight a little bit more in depth is the work that um, Clean Air Task Force is doing with our partners, RMI which is uh, the Waste Map platform. So Waste Map is funded by um, the Global Methane Hub and, and Google.org. The platform was launched at COP last year and it brings together waste sector data from different sources, including national emissions inventories, their site specific data and where they're available. Uh, it also included, includes satellite images of emissions from partners like Carbon Mapper, or, um, the Tripomi satellite that I mentioned uh, and other sources of, of the data. Um, in addition to the platform itself, the project also includes a number of um, country level engagement uh, initiatives where we're working to strengthen capacity and provide technical assistance to subnational and national governments. Uh, so in the past year, Clean Air Task Force worked in Mexico, Colombia and Ecuador, and this year we'll be con um, continuing those engagements and beginning work in Brazil, which we're really excited about. Um, so before I wrap up, I just wanted to give a thanks to um, the team of folks that we have here that are actively working in, in the region with waste and with remote sensing. Um, please reach out to us if you have any questions. And with that, I will wrap up. So thank you. Back to you, Vish. 
Thank you very much, Kate. That was a very good overview. I think it's difficult for me to summarize the whole thing, but uh, <laughs> but your presentation was very clear. Yeah. Let, let me just try a bit in Spanish, and then uh, we we of course have a lot of questions. But what we'll do is we'll go to the next uh, talk by Jose Davila, and after that we'll take questions. Um, solo para resumir un poco en español, entonces que habló sobre la importancia de metano, específicamente uh, pensando en restos orgánicos que, que forman una mayor parte de las características o de composición de residuos en la región. Uh, en América Latina contribuye más del 12% de las emisiones de metano del, que viene del sector residuos. Uh, es, es después de, del sector de combustibles o del sector de ganadería, también son importantes en tema de metano. Pero metano es algo muy clave, uh, uh, muy importante hablar porque tiene una vida útil de corto plazo, pero tiene un potencial de calentamiento global muchísimo más alto que carbón dióxido. Por eso es, es un tema bastante importante. Entonces hay varias iniciativas, incluso en la región, sobre el tema de enfocar sobre mitigación de metano, específicamente en el sector de estos residuos sólidos, pensando en restos orgánicos. Algunos países como Chile tienen sus metas de aprovechamiento de restos orgánicos. Hay uh, iniciativas globales como Global Meeting Pledge, pero también que hablo sobre la importancia de medición de metano ut utilizando datos satelitales o otros tipos de tecnologías uh, que ya tenemos. Entonces el ejemplo de Map que mostró es una plataforma donde están empezando a mapear todas estas emisiones que pueden ocurrir a nivel global con sitios uh, de disposición adecuada o o también la generación de metano a través de estos orgánicos en ciudades y otros lugares. Entonces, uh, es un breve resumen. Si tienen dudas, por favor, pueden poner en chat y más tarde vamos a tener una discusión. Uh, so, I tried my best, but, uh, but thanks for the presentation, uh, Kate. It was very useful. And uh, so before we come back to you with questions, I would like to invite now Jose Luis Davila, uh, to give us an insight as well in about uh, landfills and dump sites in the region and what are the tendencies that's happening. I think we can't hear you, you're on mute. Como siempre claro. pasa. Eh, sí, sí, ahora sí. Estaba en, en silencio el, el micrófono. Pero bueno, les comentaba que yo voy a estar representando en español eh, para cumplir con lo que dijimos de que el seminario va a ser bilingüe. Entonces, Bish ahí, ahí se va a encargar de la traducción en inglés. Y bueno, yo estoy aquí para hablarles un poquito del tema de rellenos sanitarios o, y de botaderos o vertederos eh, a cielo abierto. Eh, yo soy José Luis Dávila, ya me, ya me presentaron, soy consultor independiente desde, hace, desde el 2019. An anteriormente trabajé para una empresa consultora que eh, hicimos mucho trabajo internacionalmente. Eh, y bueno, mi experiencia ya data de unos 15 años en, el, en, en la arena internacional, sobre todo Latinoamérica, un poco en Asia. Eh, y, y bueno, aquí les voy a platicar un poquito de la situación de los rellenos sanitarios en, um, en Latinoamérica y el Caribe. Eh, por ahí hay una página que es muy nueva, tiene, apenas la lanzaron el año pasado, y es el Hub de Residuos Sólidos y Economía Circular del de Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo. Ya lo mencionó Kate. Eh, el banco es, eh, tiene una iniciativa muy fuerte en el tema de residuos y de man manejo de residuos y quieren eh, de alguna manera proporcionar eh, eh, información eh, confiable y este hub lo que hace es presentar la información disponible eh, públicamente eh, relacionada con eh, los residuos y ahí para que vean unos, unos uh, algunos eh, puntos básicos se habla de que el, esta es información del 2001 estadísticas del 2001 se habla por ahí que eh, el 50 un poquito más del 50% de los residuos llegan a sitios eh, controlados 
es decir, sitios que son eh, manejados de alguna manera con, y probablemente con recubrimiento inferior de geomembrana. Eh, luego se habla de que un 46% de los residuos en, la, en Latinoamérica y el Caribe todavía van eh, eh, a sitios eh, no controlados, perdón, ahí está equivocado, el, 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 debería decir no controlados. Y luego eh, el, el 40% de los residuos eh, están por ahí en, en, en lugares que no tienen ningún control, es decir, eh, son emitidos al ambiente, eh, como botaderos a cielo abierto, eh, ríos, eh, barrancos, cualquier tipo de, de, de disposición que no es meramente un, un sitio de disposición. Eh, y se habla también de que solo un 4.4% de los reciclables están siendo recuperados para reciclaje o de algún, tipo de algún otro tipo de manejos. Todavía hay países como Bahamas, Guyana, Haití, Surinam, Tri Trinidad y Tobago que no cuentan con sitios controlados eh, de, para disposición de residuos. Eh, y muchos otros que tienen meramente sitios controlados eh, en, en las ciudades capitales, por decir, más que nada en las, en las ciudades más grandes del, de los países. Eh, entonces todavía hay mucho campo por, por mejorar en Latinoamérica. Eh, estamos, sí estamos avanzando. Eh, eh, en cierta forma eh, la normatividad existe. Eh, estamos, eh, la mayoría de los países tienen, cuentan con una normatividad para este tipo de manejo de, de sitios de disposición. Sin embargo, muchas veces el enforzamiento de esa normatividad no existe y es por eso que vemos sitios que son mal operados o sitios que eh, sí cumplen con la norma, pero como la norma es muy general y no eh, empuja a que la operación sea más óptima, eh, siguen, siguen teniendo problemas para su operación, siguen teniendo eh, quejas de olores, quejas de vectores, de, o sea, hay, hay muchas eh, deficiencias todavía en el, en el sistema de manejo de estos, de estos sitios. Y por eso eh, es que nos, eh, me gustaría platicar un poco de, de cómo o, o de, de las mejores prácticas, que son eh, actividades que se deberían de estar eh, haciendo en estos, en estos sitios de, de disposición, pero que no se hacen una porque o, o no es enforzado por la ley o por la, las agencias eh, responsables o porque la norma no lo exige. Por ejemplo, eh, el manejo de la, del área de disposición diaria que es, eh, es, es clave para evitar o mitigar problemas de olores, problemas de vectores, problemas de eh, incremento de manejo de lixiviados eh, esa, es, esa es una área clave eh, siempre debe estar manejada de lo más pequeña posible en, en la mayoría de los rellenos que yo he visitado en Latinoamérica desafortunadamente la, el área de disposición diaria siempre es mucho más grande de lo que se necesita dos, tres, cuatro veces más grande en muchos casos hasta más eh, los temas de compactación de la, de, de la basura para poder optimizar eh, el volumen que se puede poner en un, en un, relleno, en un metro cúbico de, de espacio disponible en relleno sanitario es, es básico también. Eh, muchos muchos de, las, de los operadores no entienden o no saben eh, que eh, ya hay estudios donde se establece que un sistema, un, un compactador o un bulldozer eh, con tres o cuatro pasadas a una capa de, de 50 centímetros de basura es, es cuando vas a encontrar la compactación máxima. Ya más, si le das más de cuatro, eh, la compactación va a aumentar muy mínimo y no va a ser, eh, puede ser despe, despreciable. Entonces, eh, si tú te enfocas a entrenar a tus operadores en, en uh, operar de que le den de tres a cuatro pasadas a esa capa de basura vas a estar de una manera eh, optimizando tu compactación 
minimizando tus costos de combustible, tus costos de mantenimiento en los equipos. Entonces tiene, un, eh, tiene valores eh, adicionales, a, no solo a que tienes, vas a tener una competición eh, óptima, sino que también vas a, a poder eh, ahorrar costos en consumo de combustible, mantenimiento de equipo, etc. Eh, otro tema que es bastante común y que está, eh, no está muy bien manejado en, en Latinoamérica es el tema de los taludes. Eh, vemos taludes de uno a uno, de dos a uno, taludes eh, inclusive más de eso, y esos taludes no son óptimos. ¿Por qué? Porque en ningún momento tú vas a poder colocar en esos taludes una cobertura de suelo eficiente. ¿Por qué? Porque la máquina del compactador no va a poder subir y bajar en un, en un talud de 3 a 1, de 1 a 1 o de, de 2 a 1. Eh, los, los compactadores eh, no pueden subir en esas pendientes. Entonces tu suelo, con, eh, tu suelo de cobertura se va a lavar cada vez que llueva. Y, y esos, esos son costos de mantenimiento al, a la cobertura, costos, eh, eh, además infiltración de, de lluvia a los, a los residuos que posteriormente se convierte, convierte en lixiviado. Entonces incrementas eh, la cantidad de lixiviados que vas a estar manejando y eso es un costo adicional porque hay que, hay que manejarlo, hay que tratarlo eh, de alguna manera. Entonces son costos adicionales. Todos estos puntos eh, llevan a, a no solo a mitigar los impactos ambientales, sino también a ahorros operacionales eh, eh, de los sitios. Entonces, es importante que est estas mejores prácticas, a pesar de que no están dentro de la normatividad, eh, pues sean implementadas para mejorar eh, y mitigar los impactos que podemos hacer y los impactos ambientales y sociales alrededor del sitio y aparte eh, mejorar al, eh, los, los, los beneficios, los ingresos económicos en el, en el sitio, ¿no? Eh, y también nos ayuda a ser buenos vecinos con, con las comunidades aledañas. El monitoreo ambiental, hay un, hay un punto, bueno, la mayoría de las normatividades exigen monitoreo de agua subterránea y algunas de agua superficial, no todas. Las, las normatividades que he revisado, pero eh, la mayoría no exige migración de gas, o sea, eh, monitoreo de migración de gas. Y esto es muy importante en temas de seguridad, sobre todo si tienes comunidades aledañas al relleno sanitario, porque el, el biogás puede eh, moverse a través del subsuelo y a través de tuberías o de zanjas que existan eh, en, en el área y eh, puede llegar hasta casas o puede llegar hasta las oficinas del mismo relleno sanitario eh, y puede causar problemas de seguridad eh, que deben de ser eh, este, mitigados, ¿no? Y eh, eso no se ve en, en la normatividad en Latinoamérica. Eh, Todas, todas estas mejores prácticas ayudan a mejorar el tema del NIMBY, ¿no? El, el, el de que no quiero mi relleno cerca de mi, de mi patio, ¿no? Eh, traducción literal. Eh, ¿Por qué, es, por qué la, la mayoría de la gente no quiere relleno sanitario cerca de su patio? Porque tienen la imagen o tienen la, la experiencia de, de los sitios, de los botaderos a cielo abierto que no son controlados, tienen eh, eh, la imagen de un sitio operado no óptimamente y entonces dicen, no, yo no quiero tener todos esos problemas cerca de mi casa. Pero si nosotros operamos un relleno sanitario óptimamente, eh, es, este problema se puede ir minimizando uh, a largo plazo. Eh, y es un problema muy grande actualmente porque ya no hay... Eh, para abrir nuevos rellenos sanitarios en, en algún lugar en el mundo ya hay siempre oposición entonces tenemos que ver porque el, de alguna manera vamos a tener, que, vamos a tener un, una cantidad de residuos que tienen que ir a rellenos sanitarios y cómo van a llegar esos, esos, rellenos, esos residuos si no tenemos un sitio adecuado por ahí uh, eh, Kate mencionó que eh, 
había el 14% de los residuos del eh, el metano, las emisiones de metano son el, el sector residuos es, es 14% responsable de, de, esos, de esas emisiones. Y este dato que lo, lo tenemos, que lo tengo aquí, que es el 18% de las emisiones globales provienen de los residuos sólidos, eh, es un dato que estaba dentro de, de, la, eh, de los datos de la Iniciativa Global de Metano. No sé, por ahí hay una discrepancia, pero es um, aproximado. Y bueno, también les quería eh, platicar un poquito de México, que es donde tengo un poquito más de experiencia. Eh, y para mostrarles de que sí hemos progresado un poco, hemos avanzado pues bastante. Eh, en México existen... Bueno, eh, cuando se inició el mecanismo de desarrollo limpio bajo el protocolo de Kioto, eh, eh, por allá en el 2012, eh, se alcanzaron a registrar 29 proyectos eh, de biogás en rellenos sanitarios. De esos 29, desafortunadamente, solo 11 eh, lograron iniciar operaciones. Eh, y de esos 11, solo 9 recibieron eh, emisiones. Eh, créditos de carbono o, o los CERS, los famosos CERS. Y aquí pueden ver en esta tabla que eh, alrededor de cinco de estos proyectos de los nueve es, están generando energía eléctrica. Eh, el de Monterrey es el más eh, famoso porque fue el primero a nivel Latinoamérica, el primer proyecto de generación de energía eléctrica a, a, nivel, a nivel Latinoamérica. Y inició en el 2003 y sigue, sigue operando hasta la fecha. O sea, tiene 20 años operando. Actualmente ya están generando 17 megavatios hora. Y ellos lo que hacen con la energía es que la venden a los municipios aledaños en, la, en el área metropolitana. También se lo venden al metro urbano. Entonces al, eh, suministran energía a, a, a la misma área metropolitana. Eh, y bueno, por último, aquí les dejo unos enlaces de información, el, el hub de los residuos sólidos del, del BID, eh, el hub global de metano de la, de la coalición de, de clima y, y aire limpio, y la, el, el, la liga de la iniciativa global de metano. Y eh, si quieren saber más de rellenos, eh, Estados Unidos tiene más de eh, 60 años en el tema y ha logrado eh, muchos avances y buena operación de los mismos. Y, y aquí el, la Agencia de Protección Ambiental tiene mucha información acerca de ellos eh, disponible en su página. Eh, y bueno, abrimos la, la sesión a preguntas, pero bueno, primero Bish va a traducir ahí algo de, en inglés. Muchas gracias, uh, José Luis. Muy interesante. Gracias. Uh, so, just to summarize a little bit in English. Um, so, this was a very interesting uh, technical presentation on the state of uh, landfills and, and dump sites in the region. Uh, so, José Luis uh, first showed us about the portal. I think it's a very important portal, which is you can see the link here as well, uh, the hub de residuos solitos, which is basically the circular economy hub by the Inter-American Development Bank, which has a lot of latest data on waste in the region. But to give you a summary, basically uh, about 50% of the, of the disposal sites are controlled sites. You can say up to some point that they have geomembrane or some kind of a control over leachate and you know other aspects, environmental aspects. They mean 46 persons are basically uncontrolled sites of which about 40 percent have no environmental control. So this shows the urgency and the importance to act on this as fast as possible. So we're talking about open dump, so dump sites, which have, um, you know, probably no leachate management in place, no biogas capture and really no control about environmental management parameters. Uh, and I think uh, Jose Luis has a lot of experience with uh, operation with landfills in the region, and one of the some he pointed out some of the key challenges 
or the problems that we see in the way they are designed and also operated. For example, uh, some of the uh, sometimes a lot of landfills in the region have uh, about two to four times more area than what is required. So it's not really optimum. And even in terms of compactation, like uh, com of of the waste itself, sometimes three to four times is enough. But you often over do the compaction so which means that you are losing a lot of money in there's no efficiency in terms of operations cost uh, even even the slope of the landfill sometimes they're very steep like one is to one and one is to two what it means is that it, it will be very difficult to do the compaction first secondly there's also a lot of problem with uh, erosion that can happen in these landfills so there are a lot of technical issues as well but there's also a lot of uh, uh, guidelines and regulatory aspects that are being developed in Mexico was one of the examples which you mentioned that there are about 29 projects and of which 11 are operational and uh, some of them, most of them have access to uh, CERs or carbon credits basically using the landfill capture as well. So there are different aspects and uh, we see the problem very evident uh, that while there is traction towards making them as sustainable as possible. Um, there's still a big gap in Latin America. And some of the Caribbean states, where Caribbean countries, which he was mentioning, uh, do not have any control sites. So that's a, that's a very big challenge because we're also talking about a lot of island uh, states. And so it's important to have this in place. Uh, I think we have a lot of questions um, to, to both of you, Jose Luis and, and Kate. Uh, so uh, Jose Luis, uh, I don't know. If you can stop sharing your screen, uh, so that. Oh, okay. So yeah. Thanks. Uh, so there are uh, questions to both of you, and uh, first, I, I think Kate, uh, in terms of data for the waste methane, I think there was a specific data uh, question for a country, but in general, generally speaking, is there waste methane data available for all countries in the world, or how robust is this database, or what's missing? Yeah, so that's a really great question. Um, so generally speaking, um, most all countries that are part of the UN framework on, on climate change report national inventories every couple of years. Um, and in as part of that inventory process, they report um, waste methane emissions. Um, so I would say that that, that that is an option. There are a number of websites, including WasteMap, that take that data um, and make it a little bit easier to find and a, a little bit easier um, to, to look through and, and visualize. Um, Climate Watch is another tool that I really like. Uh, I can put, a, or maybe we can put a, a website in the chat for that, um, that, that sort of condenses down a, a lot of the information from the, the UN. Um, WasteMap also takes national inventory data, and then there are other um, platforms um, that are, are modeling data differently than what's from the UN. So um, the Edgar database is, I think, the official EU source of data. Um, there's another model um, called the GAINS model, again, slightly different, and so the results are, but um, you, know, you can sort of look across all, all of these to see the picture. Um, the, the one thing I would say with with that is that um, you know with the 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 technological advances that we've been making with satellites we're starting we, we sort of knew this but we're now able to see that modeling doesn't always um, do the best job in capturing emissions from these sites especially um, in tropical locations in Latin America because the climate um, moisture pH conditions are all very different from places you know, in like the Northern Europe and US where many of these models and, and methods were developed. So I, I think there's gonna be a lot of advances in how we think about measuring and monitoring landfill emissions moving into the future. Um, but, um, and one of the main um, challenges in, in that modeling is having access to site specific and facility specific information. So the, the basis for those models is very often just like the amount of waste that's produced in its composition. And there are you know, many cities around the world that don't really know the, the specific uh, answers to those, those questions. So um, it obviously makes those models a little bit harder to, harder to run with. Um, but, but yeah, in terms of specific countries, I would, I'll put a link in the, the chat. I would point you to some of those, those references that I, I just discussed um, for a look. Thanks, thanks Kate. 
Uh, and the second question um, is, I think Kate already responded in the chat, but also to you, Jose Luis. So the question was, are there examples of uh, capturing biogas from open dump sites, not plant fields? And uh, so Kate was suggesting that, you know, for the first thing that we should do is upgrade them. It should be a dump site, it should, it should move towards a sanitary landfill. But uh, in your experience, have you seen this in the region or anywhere else in the world? Sí, uh, está bien si sí, contesto en español. Sí. Eh, eh, bueno, eh, sí, sí se puede capturar el gas de botaderos a cielo abierto, por, de, por, si, por así llamarlos. Sin embargo, la captura no va a ser tan eficiente como si fuera un relleno sanitario, propiamente dicho, con eh, recubrimiento inferior y cobertura eh, superior. Eh, pero sí existen algunos ejemplos. Eh, estuve por ahí en Belén, eh, Brasil. El, el sitio de disposición ahí está, es, es un sitio controlado, pero es básicamente un botadero. No, mucho, mucha área de la, del relleno no tiene cobertura. Sin embargo, eh, tenían un sistema de captura y estaban capturando gas y estaban quemándolo. Claro, o sea, con todos los problemas que puede haber, que cada vez que llovía se les inundaban los, los pozos, se les inundaban las tuberías porque el agua se iba al, a los residuos y de los residuos al sistema de, de biogás. Sin embargo, eh, lograban hacer al, algo de captura de biogás, pero, pero sí no es, tan, no es tan eficiente como si lo hiciéramos en un relleno sanitario, propiamente dicho. Pero sí se puede. Gracias, Jose Luis. Just to translate, yeah, I mean, it is uh, technically possible, but of course not efficient, as Jose Luis was saying. I think someone in the chat also mentioned that the Gasipur landfill in India is also doing this. Uh, and in his experience, he also mentioned about Belen and Brazil, which also has such an option. But but the, at the end of the day, it's very inefficient because if the drainage systems are not fine, then you have flooding in, in the in the extraction wells. And, you know, it's not really efficient thing to do, But but there are examples of this. Um, I have uh, more questions, so I'll try to see if I can uh, combine them. Um, so there, uh, I think the next question would be again to you, Jose Luis, uh, in terms mm -hmm. of um, the use of biogas. There are some questions in the chat, but also to combine it with what we had before. So you showed us examples of Mexico, that there are the CDM projects in the region, but uh, do you see the trend across Latin America in terms of policy that this, this is becoming mandatory, the capture of biogas and sanitary landfills? If not, what is the reason? Eh, en, en, uh, hasta el momento, en lo que yo he experimentado en Latin America es de que ninguna de las regulaciones hablan de eh, quemar o de usar el gas. Hablan más bien de el manejo del biogas y prácticamente es, muy, es un término muy general, entonces lo que hacen como manejo es ven, ventear el gas a la atmósfera. Eh, entonces, pero eh, lo, algo que pasó que es muy interesante mencionar, eh, cuando el mecanismo de desarrollo limpio se implementa, eh, el, meca el mecanismo de desarrollo limpio habla de una línea base. Entonces la línea base está en base a qué es lo que exige el país en ese momento que se va a generar el proyecto, que se va a desarrollar el proyecto. Entonces, en ese momento, en el 2012, pues nadie exigía eh, la quema del biogás. Entonces, la línea base era cero. Entonces, tú, al momento de implementar el, el biogás, todas esas emisiones se convertían en certificados cuando las eliminabas por quema o por uso de, de, del biogás. Eh, y esto hizo que la normatividad como que se quedara un poco atrás, ¿no? Porque si los países implementaban normatividad que exigiera quema de biogás, entonces ya la línea base se iba a mover más arriba y ya no iban a, a, a poder generar créditos de carbono. Entonces fue algo así como que un caso 21, ¿no? Como dicen en inglés, que... O hacemos uno o hacemos el otro, o cómo le hacemos para que funcionen esos proyectos y puedan generar créditos de carbono. Entonces ahí fue como hubo un retraso en la normatividad, a pesar de que hubo un avance técnico en eh, el desarrollo de estos proyectos en Latinoamérica. 
sobre todo en Brasil y en México, que sí. bueno, Chile también alcanzó a, a, a desarrollar un par de proyectos también. Eh, bastantes países en Latinoamérica tienen uno o, o dos proyectos funcionando hasta la fecha. Los más grandes, Chile y México, eh, y, y, y probablemente Brasil. En Brasil estoy un poquito fuera de de actualización, eh, pero Brasil siempre ha avanzado bastante fuerte en el tema de utilización y generación de gas, y generación de electricidad. Muchas gracias, José Luis. Uh, just to translate, I think that's a very important point which uh, José Luis was mentioning regarding policy with mandating the use of biogas or flaring. I think the baseline was very important. The baseline uh, in a lot of countries were was basically not doing anything. So flaring is something con considered additional so that you know you start getting carbon credits for this. Now, th that's also one of the disadvantage of the CDM mechanisms is that if you make your baseline as flaring, as mandatory for everyone in the policy, which means that that's not additional anymore. So you can't get carbon credits and more so you need to use them. So that even though there is technological advancements and we see examples, he was mentioning in Chile, Mexico, Brazil, which are more advanced, uh, but there are some, some gaps in the space. Um, and the next question to Kate, uh, so do you see any discrepancy between, uh, I think the national inventory of uh, GHG emissions, which countries do report, versus measured data. Do you have some examples of, are they similar or is there a difference? Yeah, so, um, so I would say at this point, no one, there is not a, there is not a methodology for using measured satellite data for creating a national inventory from, from the waste sector. Um, there's still a, like, we're able to now see um, emissions from these sites, plumes and, and concentrations of, of methane, but um, it, the, the data is still very site specific. We're like, most countries don't have a complete view of every landfill or, or dump site and, and emissions coming from them. However, that study that I had up on the screen earlier that looked at those four cities did compare emissions to city level inventories. And I think um, if I remember that study correctly, that, that data showed that that landfill emissions were much larger than they had been reported in the inventories. Um, and at one of the sites, I'm not, I can't re remember specifically which one right now, but um, the emissions were shown to be like about 50% of total reported emissions for the entire city, um, which was, you know, much larger than than previously assumed. And I'll just say that's a, that's a point in time measurement. That study, I think, looked at emissions over a period of four months and Obviously, landfills are very dynamic in, in their emissions, and so um, that might that fifty percent might not be the case over the entire year, but it does give us um, a, a glimpse into what's really happening at, at these locations. Thanks, Kate. Uh, the next question, uh, please feel to jump in, in uh, Kate. So it's in terms of uh, financing or even closure of dump site projects. So typically, uh, what kind of for rehabilitation or even closure of these uh, these sites, is there a prerequisite in terms of financing? And also maybe from your experience, uh, how do you think uh, countries are financing these projects? Because are they profitable or not? And what should happen? Bueno, en, en el caso de México, eh, se ha demostrado que eh, económicamente los proyectos son factibles tal vez por el costo de energía, ¿no? Como es, la mayoría de los proyectos son generación de energía eléctrica eh, en México, entonces eh, el, el, el valor de la energía es, el, es la clave, ¿no? Eh, sí han generado certificados, sin embargo, pues los certificados ah, actualmente el valor de ellos no es tan, no es un valor muy... Eh, muy grande, entonces eh, pues no es algo que, de, que diga, bueno, por, por el hecho de los créditos ahora es factible el proyecto. No, es, es más bien por, por el costo de energía. Eh, por ejemplo, en Colombia es muy difícil hacer un proyecto factible de energía eléctrica porque la energía es, es, es muy baja, el costo de la energía es bajo. 
porque la mayoría de la energía que se genera en Colombia pues es por hidroeléctrico, es por eh, fuente hidroeléctrica. Entonces, eh, sí, eh, ahí, ahí el factor eh, valor del precio de energía es, es lo que sería clave para poder que un proyecto sea factible. Ahora se están viendo algunos proyectos de combustible vehicular, que también es posible, eh, porque pues el combustible vehicular siempre es mucho más costoso en los países latinoamericanos, inclusive más que en Estados Unidos. Eh, los precios de Latinoamérica andan casi igual que, eh, o el doble de lo que es en Estados Unidos. Entonces, también podría ser algo interesante ahí, generar combustible vehicular. Pero también implica que vas a tener que eh, implementar vehículos que utilicen ese tipo de combustible, no solo de diésel, sino que también vas a tener que cargo de conversión de, de, de tecnología vehicular y aparte generar ese tipo de combustible pero son factibles técnicamente y se están logrando en Estados Unidos y en otros países. Perfecto. Yeah, And just yeah. quickly to add to that, um, that I think that some of the initiatives that I mentioned do consider um, closing open jump sites as, as well within the scope. So like the Too Good to Waste initiative from the IDB that, that is considered in there. Um, and uh, a number of other development banks around the world do provide funding for that. Um, it just, you know, just depends on the bank and generally the size of projects that they like to work with. Um, so, um, recommend doing a little bit of research in, into that. Great. Well, thanks a lot. Uh, I think we are almost out of time. So, but, but thanks a lot to both of you. This was a really good uh, insight into what's happening in the region, but technically in terms of landfills and pump sites and the methane part, Kate, uh, and especially the data that you mentioned. We really look forward to all this data and I'm sure people uh, will have, the audience has more questions and please feel to write to us and you know we'll try to resolve them as, as much as possible. And uh, yeah, thanks, thanks, thanks a lot, everyone. And uh, Akanksha, over to you to close the Thank video. you, thank you, Vishwas, and thank you to the panel uh, for taking time out and sharing their knowledge and experience with all of us. Uh, we're very glad that we are able to capture interesting opinions and voices from the region, and uh, very happy to see the uh, audience participation as well. Uh, this pl platform makes it even more relevant to have people as diverse and uh, contrary to each other as possible. Uh, to have uh, constructive insights or you know discussions on such topics. As I mentioned, this webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded on Be Waste Wise uh, webinar and you, um, uh, website and YouTube channel. Uh, if you want to stay updated on future events and upcoming uh, webinars, then please subscribe to our newsletter and follow us on social media. Uh, thank you again for having us. And uh, we hope to see all of you again for yet another uh, topic, maybe from Vishwas soon. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.